Hello, everyone. Uh, people are just starting to come in, so I'm going to give it just a couple of seconds as people connect to the webinar. I'm so happy to see everybody coming in and uh, so excited to be joining for another Classics Research. <laughs> while we wait, uh, Michael, just so you know, you're not muted right now. Um, while we wait, uh, why don't you go ahead and let us know where you're coming from, uh, just so that we can see where everybody's coming from and listening to us today. We are so happy to be continuing this conversation and providing a work break with more great titles of the world. Today, we will begin the last four novels in our series. We will be starting our short discussions on long novels with the American classic of Moby Dick. We're going to give everyone just a few minutes to log in and get settled. While we do that, please change that chat panel to make sure you're sharing with all attendees and panelists. We do like to share the chat if we can. Um, and that way everybody can see where people are joining from, um, as well as any questions that might pop up in the chat. Published in 1851, Moby Dick has become one of the great American classics taught all over uh, the United States in both high school and universities. A book that only sold a few thousand copies in Melville's lifetime is now considered so advanced for a its time that it is still taught. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear all of those questions that Dr. Segrew's may le lecture may inspire. Make sure you throw them into the question and answer panel. So today I have the great pleasure to once again, welcome back Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. Dr. Segrew is a professor um, is a graduate of the Great Books program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Professor Segrew has taught at prestigious universities such as Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and so many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm the Global Marketing Specialist here at Biblioteca. And behind the scenes, we have my colleague, Mackenzie Crane, helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. She'll be sharing links throughout the lecture um, and discussion of uh, thing, sources that we found very helpful. We will once again, hopefully be sharing the chat log with all attendees. So make sure you switch your settings to all attendees and panelists. If you have specific questions, please use the Q&A panel. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see similar questions or something you just want answered. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear um, all of the questions that this lecture may inspire. And now without further ado, I want to uh, present Michael for the lecture of Moby Dick. Once again, this has been pre-recorded, but he will be joining us at the end of the presentation for a live Q&A session. Sit back and enjoy. Arguably the greatest American novel is Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And uh, like many difficult long novels, it uh, had a mixed reception among reviewers. Uh, it was published in 1851 in the US and then a few years later in England. And uh, it's a very long, almost, global novel that happens on the sea, which allows and encourages uh, mobility. So in some ways, Moby Dick is a novel about uh, change of location and the journey motif that holds so much of Western literature is going to, together, um, is going to be found here. Now, Melville borrows heavily from earlier traditions of writing, most importantly and most obviously in his use of the Bible. Ahab is taken from the Old Testament. He was an evil king and uh, he turned the Israelites away from worship of Yahweh because he married Jezebel 
and she brought in foreign gods. So in the book of Kings, Ahab is represented as not being a good king. And uh, he is a kind of evil king of the Pequod, the ship that he sails. And there's much in the language of uh, Ahab that sounds, at least to my ear, uh, very Miltonic. It sounds like there's a great deal of Milton's Satan in Ahab, his twisted obsession to go and even the score with an aquatic mammal uh, that he personifies. So uh, Ahab is in some ways uh, renewing the old epic tradition of the quest for the Holy Grail, except here it's inverted. Rather than searching for the access to divinity, here we act, we're, we're searching for the personification, the incarnation of evil, of a malevolent nature. Uh, and the meaning of the whale is as zigzag and erratic and uncertain as uh, the course of the whale across the ocean. Uh, strangely enough, Moby Dick right, is one of the characters in the book, like Starbuck or Pip. Uh, he has a proper name, he has intentions, <laughs> and not only did he bite Ahab's leg off, he wanted to <laughs> because it was personal, because Moby Dick is a person as far as Ahab is concerned. <coughs> The, um, the madness and the malignancy of, of uh, Ahab's monomania is uh, inevitably going to lead to death. And uh, the reflections on mortality that Ahab makes are amongst the most chilling in all of literature. Now, in addition, to both Milton and the Bible, there's certainly quite a bit in Moby Dick that's derived from Shakespeare. Right? Someone that says driven and driven out of their mind as say Othello is, all right, but not for a short duration, for an extended period of time. He's in a mental frenzy. And also there are many references to Hamlet as well. So uh, Moby Dick is a book in some ways for literary sleuthing. His connection to the earlier canonical works is very clear, at least to those that know them. And that's what he assumes that his mid 19th century audience will have as a background, all right? So you can't miss the biblical references. Uh, this is a quest for an unholy grail. Um, now, it is a fascinating book in many ways. One of the gestures that it makes towards universality is the heterogeneity of the crew of the Pequod. They come from every nation, every religion, every uh, ethnicity, every possible uh, group of people, every tribe one way or another is represented in the crew of the Pequod. They come from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America. Um, I don't think any came from Antarctica, but um, there's every group and every subgroup or a gesture at every subgroup to be found there. There's a great deal of, uh, of complexity in the collection that gets made of men who are willing to undertake a four year uh, sailing voyage to kill whales. So uh, uh, Fidala, the uh, harpoonist for Ahab is a Parsi and Queequeg comes from Polynesia and uh, Ishmael, 
course, comes from the Bible, but he also comes, begins the journey in Manhattan and comes up to New Bedford to uh, get him, get a place on a whaling ship. Uh, it's uh, a fascinating exploration of 19th century biology. Uh, it tells you more about whales than you genuinely need to know. There is a big chunk of cetology, which is the study of whales and such more and similar marine animals um, that reflects the limited understanding that they had. Melville describes whales as fish that breathe air. We, they would not be so described nowadays, they'd be described as aquatic mammal. But although he gets the cetology wrong, he does know an astonishing amount of fact about the whaling business, about catching whales, killing whales, dissecting whales, breaking them up, boiling them down to liquid oil, and then putting them in barrels. Uh, this is called trying the blubber. And that's what they were whaling for. They're trying to get oil, which would be used for lamps in an age before kerosene. So uh, whale oil illuminated American homes and British homes too, and homes in quite a few places actually, but the, uh, the oil itself is rather difficult to process. And uh, we know, we, we learn a great deal about that process. And although it does make the uh, create a sense of authenticity in the novel. Um, I've often thought that Melville, like Cervantes in uh, uh, Don Quixote, uh, that he would have a better book if he had less book, that it really needs an editor that's sensitive to the nuance of the book, but that it could be reduced and made more precise. I guess Melville makes the novel and its contents as heterogeneous as the crew of the Pequod. Uh, there's a bit of lore about the sea. There's discussions of human nature and about the existence of God. There are uh, discussions of, uh, of uh, the ultimate significance of death and how death restrains and constrains our actions. Uh, it's also about, in a, a very important way, um, about uh, male bonding in the following sense. There's a deeply homosexual, homoerotic element in Herman Melville, and it makes it sound surprisingly contemporary. You have to remember, this is written like Billy Budd, uh, before the American Civil War, right? Here we are in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, the fact, and you have to keep in mind that the historical context here is that if this is going to be published in Boston or New York or Philadelphia, wherever he's going to go, he's going to have to deal with censorship. So um, nothing overtly sexual Nothing that would be that's regarded as sacrilegious or, dis, or uh, uh, dismissive of religion would be allowed. Uh, certainly, no homosexual references would be allowed. And yet, um, Melville manages to introduce them and introduces them in ways that are not subtle. Uh, one of the remarkable things about Moby Dick is uh, how much. Uh, the male bonding uh, seems like a kind of, uh, how can I put it, a homosexual uh, backdrop to much of what goes on here in this purely masculine society. Some examples, Ishmael, who's our narrator, and remember that he is the uh, son of Hagar that gets driven out uh, and dispossessed, um, before he can actually get his place on the whaling ship, he uh, 
sleeps with Queequeg in the hotel. Uh, he says, uh, better a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. And so uh, here, remember, sleeping together was not by itself regarded as homosexual. Um, hotels or places, where, inns, places where you could sleep, taverns or brothels, um, you would often end up sleeping uh, two or three or four to a bed, depending on how much demand there was. So rather than getting turned away, everybody finds his place in the bed, and uh, that would not be thought unusual. Uh, on the other hand, when Queequeg embraces him and says, we are now married, and uh, one of the lines he used to describe it is, we were on our heart's honeymoon. Um, the homosexual undertones are actually overtones, it seems to me. I mean, how could the censors miss this? And yet they did. One of the most remarkable, I mean, and it's in Billy Budd too. There it's a little more stealthy, but here, um, when we get to chapter 94, um, the convergence of the homosexuality and the, uh, the cetology yields some very, very strange stuff, unusual, actually unique, as far as I can tell, in serious 19th century literature. Um, chapter 94, The Squeezing of the Hand, is aptly focused on uh, the processing of spermaceti. And so it involves squeezing sperm. Yes, an entire crew breaking up clumps of sperm, which spontaneously hardens into liquid. And so it, it has this emollient effect on their hands and they're all joining hands uh, and processing as, as Melville describes it, the milk and sperm of human kindness. Now, this sounds to me like a nautical orgy, and it's so remarkable that the censors in Boston did not see this as uh, uh, questionable. They cut out other things, references to gods, particularly used when swearing, but the things that they allowed to get by are truly astonishing. Yes, I'm sure that Melville could plausibly answer. Yes, this, this is what the processing of spermaceti involves. And yet uh, a whole chapter on the squeezing of hands and the milk and sperm of human kindness, uniting the whole crew, um, then moves on to the next chapter, which is chapter 95, which is subtly titled The Cassock. And it turns out, that the cassock is the whale's reproductive organ, the one they, are, they have just killed, and it is a massive, gigantic penis. Now, this discreetly described uh, gigantic penis, again, seems to connect this to the homosexual imagery of the previous chapter. And once again, I'm wondering, how is it conceivable that 19th century Bostonians, or for that matter, inhabitants of London who were equally prone to uh, censorship, how they let this get by is quite remarkable. Um, it's a brilliant uh, take on the quest theme. And uh, in this novel, we are realizing one possible view of nature. This is late romanticism, 1851, and nature has become decidedly malevolent. Uh, the personification of nature uh, and the obsession that Abraham, that Ahab has with the whale marks a, a kind of mental breakdown on his part if you were to think about romanticism and its two valences in uh, William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, well, um, Ahab and his connection to nature 
is much more the tiger than it is the lamb. And as Blake asks, did he who made the lamb make thee? And that's the, uh, the last phase of romanticism, I'd be inclined to say. Um, by the time we get to the middle of the, of the 19th century, the view of human nature and the view of nature itself has darkened considerably. This attempt to get beyond reason and beyond cold calculating logic has led to a kind of maelstrom, both in the physical sense, the one that pulls down uh, Ahab, but also uh, an intellectual and moral and emotional maelstrom. We all descend into Ahab's madness. Uh, it's a deeply uh, disturbing book because this is something worth thinking about because we're going to be talking about a number of famous novels. Um, there's something very peculiar in the novel in the following sense. Um, we recognize in some uncanny way that we're being told what we already know. The strange familiarity of unfamiliar places like, oh, uh, pre-World War I Germany or Soviet Russia or pre-Soviet Russia or uh, ancient Greece, or for that matter, an American whaling ship. Any of these places these very exotic locations can be made familiar if the observations that are made about human nature are sufficiently general. So somehow we see ourselves in people who are very different from us. And that's the function of these great works of literature. They educate our imagination and the educated imagination um, is, is a way of developing uh, the various capacities within the mind. You wouldn't want to let the imagination fend for itself because it'll find junk. It's much better off focusing on works like uh, Melville or Dostoevsky or Mann or Joyce that gesture something at something big and uni even universal in human nature. So that's what I want to talk about in these short discussions of long books. And I'll see you again next time when we do another long. Uh, I think the end of the video got cut off there for just a moment, but uh, that's okay. We got most of the lecture going. Hi, Michael. How are you today? I'm just fine. Thank you. And yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So it was a great introduction. It's actually one of the reasons why I chose to do Moby Dick first of the next four, uh, because you you introduce it in that sense of these short discussions of long books, because mm -hmm. obviously these novels that are coming up, including Moby Dick, are just huge novels that have been around for years and years and years, but you could you could have an entire semester of classes on, on this single novel. Absolutely so, true. I appreciate you joining us for some lecture or for some Q and A afterwards. Um, I have to say that I am very proud of myself for having finished the book. It is it is quite a, a large one. I think I had read um, in a younger age an abridged version, but the abridged version obviously really just boils it down to the story. It's a very easy book to abridge depending on how you're looking at it, but. Uh, <laughs> But I did read the whole thing, and um, I have to. I have to start with asking you, um, what is the point of the book? <laughs> like oh. flat out asking you. There's so much in it, and I know that's a very broad question. I know you discussed it a little bit, but just give us kind of like a, a general outline before we get into other questions of like why do you think Melville wrote this? Wrote this story that includes not only the story of Ahab and Moby Dick, but you know, cetology and whaling and all of these inserts, but, you know, with the modern day or the, the local period. Oh, uh, you see, it's those short, direct questions that are always the hardest. What is the point <laughs> of Moby Dick? It's a little bit like asking, what's the point of Finnegan's Wake? It's I true. Mean, I immediately feel a headache coming on trying to answer. <laughs> Let me give it a crack. 
Um, answer is, as far as I can see, is that there's no consensus. Uh, there are a number of things, particularly about the conclusion, which tend to inform my the, the things that I think are plausible readings of what comes earlier. But uh, the fact that Ahab dies in his mad monomaniacal quest to kill uh, the white whale um, seems to make it the opposite of the way, or it seems to construct a story that is constructed the opposite of the way most epic stories are. And the uh, and Moby Dick is nothing if not epic and it's sat mm -hmm. in, in its structure and its enormity. But he, usually we have the hero come back and you know show everybody why things should be the way they are. Instead, here we got a crazy man attached to a giant white whale. And the whale is a person, which is very strange. Uh, there's something deep in our psyche which holds on to early primitive conceptions of nature, which per personifies the stuff around us, uh, particularly the dangerous stuff. Uh, the white whale, Moby Dick, he's a person, just like the, the historical real world predecessor, whose name was Mocha Dick. He was actually, he had a proper name. Uh, we do the same thing with things like hurricanes now. It's not just a, some wind and some rain that damaged my roof. It was Hurricane Bob, if you see what I'm saying. Um, yeah. It's personal when we allow the forces of nature to become personified. And there's a certain sort of madness in that. Yeah. I was um I was trying to explain the book to to someone and, and I had told you a little bit about this before the webinar started. It's a very interesting book because the story is very intriguing and it is layered and and the the nice thing about all of the information with the whales and the whaling and the historical context of what was going on at the time just modern day um, in 1851 is all it it does layer in. It gives you a better picture of what's going on um including just the workings of a ship if you weren't familiar with the ship and ship life in the 1800s was very common for a lot of people. It's how most people traveled, uh, long distances, so on and so forth. But the best analogy I could really come up with was it was almost like a professor wanted to teach people about what he felt was going on in the world and, and impart knowledge about whales, whaling, his life on whaling, and decided to make the class interesting by creating a story around it. And so you had to attend the whole semester to get the whole story but ultimately he was imparting this wisdom that he thought now, obviously some of it has been proven uh, through research, through, through um, science has been proven different, but at the time it was fairly adept with, with information. I wanted to ask you, what was Melville's background? I know he did um, about three or four years as a whaler on a ship, sure. but what was his educational background? Because he has a lot of knowledge in this book. Yeah. Um like most 19th century American authors, um, uh, he is largely an autodidact. He has a great job, a kind of sinecure uh, in New York City, which allows him to have enough time to reflect and write. And uh, he's, uh, he's obsessed with the things that 19th century Americans were obsessed with, good and evil, the place of man in the universe, and also with the legacy of English literature, because they're all a little bit um, touchy because the, the Americans haven't made much of a contribution yet. So Melville and Hawthorne and uh, other 19th century American writers are doing their best to show that they can keep up with the tradition and that, that they're aware of the, of the tradition of, of English literature. So for example, Ahab has a lot of Milton Satan in him, you know, the madness, the pride, the singular status. Do you remember when uh, the lightning comes down from the sky and it lights up the doubloon and the uh, mass, but it also lights up <laughs> Ahab too? Uh, there's something unique about him because ordinary human people die when they get electrocuted. Here the symbol is something, something very diabolical seems to be happening. It's a sort of fallen angel. So, uh, you know, it helps if you know Milton. It also helps if you know Shakespeare. There's a lot of beautiful Shakespearean language. It's quite lush. And uh, you get, I get the impression often that um, Melville can't control himself. He can't help himself once he's on a roll. And God bless him if he can do it. If you go back and you look at the dialogue between Pip and, a and Ahab, it sounds very much like the clever banter that you get between uh, the fool and King Lear. 
So this is heavily dipped in Shakespeare and in the Bible and in uh, other authors like Milton. So in some ways, what he's doing is showing off his knowledge of the tradition. So you're right. There is a sort of overcompensation here. He is a little bit like an insecure professor. Part of that is the fact that he's a mid 19th century American writer and they get largely laughed at by genuine English literary society. Okay, that's a really interesting way to, to compare it. I hadn't really put the context of just the, the fact that America in 1851, less than hundred years old as a country itself, mo you know, we really hadn't had anything that was put to America's name uh, as a contribution to, to the greater society. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Milton, but before I go ahead and ask this question that came in via registration, I wanna just remind everybody that you are more than welcome if you have questions as, uh, the, as Michael and I discuss uh, Moby Dick to feel free to put them into the question and answer and we'll definitely get to them. So one of the, one of the questions that came in and you've kind of already answered this, but came in via registration was Harold Bloom compared Judge Holden as more akin to the white whale than Ahab, is either comparison justified? Had Melville read Paradise Lost? And was Milton Satan a primary source for Ahab? Okay, yes, Melville is well read. Yes, he has read Paradise Lost. Uh, he was uh, among the literati in American coastal cities, which is where you could find uh, people who are concerned with literature. Um, mastering the tradition of particularly English literature was very important. Well, they all had to know Latin and it was, and some of them knew Greek, but they all knew English literature well. So all of them had read Milton, right? And so I guess that we go back to Bloom's anxiety of influence that's being exerted here. How can I create a character that can stand in with this gigantic, colossal figure of pride? And uh, I think he came over, he came, you know, he did a pretty good job in the case of, of Ahab. Now the whale, I think is more like Judge Holden in uh, Blood Meridian. And okay. that explicitly uh, uh, McCarthy is making reference back to that. I think what this requires is the reading at the end where the whale does not die because it's ambiguous. If the whale doesn't die, it can be seen as a, as a symbol of the fact that uh, evil is permanent in the sense, it, to the extent that human beings are permanent. And what that would mean is that it's a reprise of that insight that we get when the, with the judge at the end of Blood Meridian, when he dances around and says, I will never die, I will never die. So that brings up a question that um, once again, you and I have started with, I like the idea of evil always present, that, that if, the, if, if Moby Dick, if the whale is representative of evil, then does he die? Um, can you discuss the ending of the book a bit, or in my opinion, the disappointment of the ending? Um, we have just read this long, detailed no novel in a way that, you know, we don't know if we're cheering for Ahab or for the crew or for the whale, and yet in a way it just ends. We have about a three-page epilogue allowing us to see how Ishmael survived to tell us the story, and yet no... Um, overarching point no no final directive no except for just th this is life like this this is the end um so can, uh, can you go into great, a little bit depth of that great collection of questions um <laughs> how does this ending work well i think it can sustain the reading either way that the whale dies or that the whale lives either that and then that it connects to how you view the symbolism of the whale all right. Okay. If you think it represents evil, or if you just think it represents uh, the demonic side of nature, which would be a kind of different judgment about it, um, they're going to connect to the way you think that the whale finally ends up. Um, Ahab has to be killed because he's a tragic figure. He's got to cause his own death. On the other hand, um, the crew are a fascinating lot. In other words, you couldn't find a better sample, you know, in 20 or 25 men of every scrap of DNA on the planet. In other words, these guys come from the poles to the equator and they come from east to west in every direction. And uh, we have black and white and red and yellow and brown and what a collection. And they hardly speak a, 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 a connecting language. And uh, they are in some ways the 
how can I put it, the, the representative outcasts of every culture. Because you got to remember, the narrator says, call me Ishmael. And Ishmael is the outcast son of Hagar and Abraham. And he too is an outcast. So this is a crew of outcasts led by a madman who is kind of diabolical in his own way. It's interesting um, as we get to discuss the, the races of the ship. So um, I, I worked part of one of my jobs was I worked on, on a cruise line for five years. And it, it's so funny because one of the things that was said, and it was said as kind of a teaching thing, it was said to the, the guests if they, you know, during the final show, I was like, you know, we're kind of like the United Nations. It doesn't matter which culture we come from. It doesn't matter which country we come from. We figure out how to work together because that's the only way the ship will run. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I saw here too, is because in the, I don't want to say the height, but in definitely a time where, where racial segregation, I mean, slavery was still happening. Let's, let's not forget that for 10 more years, uh, slavery was completely acceptable in the United States, or at least completely legal in the United States, maybe not acceptable to everybody. But even that was referenced uh, in, in Pip, like Pip was on a boat and I believe it was with Stubb, it was either with Stubb or with Starbuck who says, you do that again, I can sell you for more than you're worth on the ship. Um, so what, what do you think Melville is, is saying here or is he saying anything to, to bring these races together and show that it doesn't matter what race you are, especially on a ship, your life is in each other's hands maintaining uh, an understanding of the difference between subjects and objects or between people and things, all right, is one of the touchstones of sanity. Now, the problem that Pip, ha that Pip has is that he's forced to encounter when he's given his, you know, his, the fact that he can be sold for more than he's worth, um, he's being told that in fact, he has a market value and he's an object. And when that cuts deep into his psyche, uh, that's connected to the breakup of his psyche. Uh, this pattern of treating people like things and also treating things like people is a sign of, of gross mental pathology in the ship, in particular parts of the ship, but particularly with Ahab. Had you noticed that Ahab talks to inanimate objects and uh, under other circumstances, people might think that peculiar. But uh, Captain Ahab gets mad at his sextant because it tells him where he is rather than where he's going to be, which is mad. He has a discussion, a kind of interesting soliloquy, with the dead head of a whale. He uh, discusses things with his doubloon and also with his magic harpoon that also gets hit with the lightning. I mean, this sounds like a like an, a Wagnerian offshoot. <laughs> the idea of being hit with a with a uh, with lightning, surviving it, and having your special magical harpoon be ready to kill the giant beast. I mean, this is quite operatic, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many uh, strange qualities in Ahab that. I think he's unique in the same way that Raskolnikov is unique in, in Western literature. Okay. Well, and Ahab's descent into madness, I mean, one of, you mentioned it with the, the uh, parallel between King Lear and, and, and the fool and Ahab and Pip, like that's, an, that's a great example of it didn't matter which color, it didn't matter. It's like Ahab recognized madness and madness. That's right. And there's a similarity there. There's a familiarity there because, you know, like at least that's how I read it was, you know, Pip is going off on, on a mad tangent. Now, Pip was one that we saw go mad, like, you know, was a fairly um, straightforward character, very minimal character. And then within a number of chapters throughout the second half of the book, you just watch him delve into the madness and, it, you know, and, and really the final final delve would be the conversation with Queequeg on, on Queequeg's supposed deathbed. Didn't That's it be right. his deathbed, but supposed deathbed. But it, it, it's that familiarity, it's that connection um, that everybody, Queequeg and Ishmael find a connection in very, two very unlikely characters, um, which uh, Ahab and Pip, like even Starbuck and, and, and Ahab, I have a question regarding their relationship was very um, interesting to me because, 
you know, Starbuck being the first mate is, you know, like typically you would count for the first mate to truly question the captain, especially for madness, if the fear for safety on the crew, which he did at least once regarding the, the oil leakage or the oil spill. But Ahab and Starbuck seem to have an understanding. That's a connection that I would like you to go into a little bit more if you can. That's because hard, yeah. even to the point that Ahab asks Starbuck to hoist him to the watch during the final chase scenes, <laughs> which yeah. is like the ultimate trust in another person. Um, Ahab is confident in the loyalty of Starbuck. And he is also confident that he is skating close enough to the line between madness and sanity that mm -hmm. Starbuck isn't going to get in the way. He'll continue to obey orders until Ahab does something so gross that he pushes Starbuck's hand. Starbuck is, by preference, um, a first mate, which means that he doesn't generally take responsibility for making decisions. And uh, there's something about his inactivity Mm -hmm. which uh, makes him, again, a nice foil to Ahab, who is, who is not only an active rather than a contemplative man, but his activity is all focused towards one thing, killing this whale on the other side of the world. So uh, Starbuck and, and uh, Ahab um, feed off each other because Starbuck is indecisive, and, you know, we get a, a num plenty of examples of that in the history of Western literature. Uh, Hamlet himself, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, Ahab is all busyness. The problem is it's a wicked uh, um, uh, psychopathic wickedness. It's, it's interesting because I almost, um, until near the end, was putting Starbuck, you know, in, in, a, in a dark comedy, you always have the straight man, you know, and I call it a dark comedy, not, I mean, you have a straight man normally in a regular comedy too, but in a dark comedy, you have the extremely mad, mad person uh, that's just over the top mad. And then you also have the extremely, not necessarily mad, but like greedy, or they have their own agenda. And I always considered Stubb as having his own agenda. He has a lot more focus throughout the book than, um, than Starbuck does, and also for a while than Ahab does. You, you hear more about uh, Stubb and his ventures on the whale boat than you do about Ahab for quite some time. Um, and so that's kind of where I put Starbuck in my head was as the straight man, but it is a very interesting relationship between the two of them. Straight man is a very nice way to put it. Stubb <laughs> is here as homo economicus. He's going to do the calculation and find out what the best return is, and that's what he's here for. He has no personal vendetta and thinks that's crazy. Um, uh, the interesting thing about uh, Ahab and, and his final breakdown, there's a wonderful example of uh, the use of, I don't know, uh, ambiguous but powerful symbolism when, when lightning hits the compass of mm -hmm. the ship now, the ship itself is a microcosm of the whole world, is one of everything here. And we are now out of uh, help from navigational aids. We no longer have the mariner's compass, which means we're completely afloat, which means that this boat now is the analog of Pip adrift in the sea. <laughs> right? And that's why okay. the madness resonates and reiterates, oh, God, we're now Pip and no one's coming to pick us up. So Ahab, our, uh, our Miltonic Satan, steps up and says, I'm going to construct my own compass out of my harpoon and a couple of the things we have here. Um, it is a very dark character in the middle of the 19th century that constructs his own compass, yeah. <laughs> right? Because that's not the natural compass that magnetic uh, compasses point to. This is uh, having the entire orientation of the ship taken over by the mad uh, direction of uh, Ahab's obsession. That's a, that's a really interesting comparison. I hadn't, I hadn't seen that in the compass factor, but yeah, you're right. Like, especially in mid 18th, mid, mid 19th century, someone who's, who's being guided by their own direction <laughs> um, outside of the church, outside of the political spectrum, whatever is, is definitely, especially in America at the time, it's definitely exactly. uh, considered more of a dangerous thought process. So skipping ahead to just kind of con context of today, 
Uh, why do you think the book became so popular in the early 20th century when it wasn't overly popular actually throughout all of Melville's life? Like he only sold about a, you know, a few thousand books, copies before he passed away. And really the resurgence from what I read was closer to like, you know, the 19, uh, early 1900s, 19, 19, 19 teens, 1920s. Yeah. Um, certain books are uh, written out of season. You know, they're written before their time and they don't get a readership or at least a, an appreciative readership when they get put out. Uh, this happens to be one of those. Um, I have a couple of guesses. One, because unless they had the imprimatur of uh, eminent literary figures, Americans were likely to see American literature as being inferior. Remember that the novel in the 19th century didn't have much, didn't have the status that say ancient epic poetry did. That was thought to be real literature. Uh, it was a kind of second class comic book level of uh, literature that, that uh, novel uh -huh. was understood to be. So uh, often uh, professors, if you look back in the 19th century, would complain that their students spend their time reading novels, which are usually essentially romances. And uh, they think that's a waste of time. Um, so I think part of it is the genre and part of the fact that it's Native American, that it's uh, American literature. Uh, the second part is in the 20th century, there was a new fascination with the irrational, with the, uh, um, with the uh, say, uh, psychopathic. I think you can connect that, for example, to the, to the cultural emergence of Freud but also of uh, literary figures like D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence certainly focuses on the irrational in human nature. And at the same time, he sees uh, that same demonic focus on emotion in Melville and in Moby Dick, I think. So he was one of the great uh, advocates for Moby Dick. And it's understandable given uh, his antipathy towards reason and the enlightenment. Okay. Right? Um, one of the questions that just came in is, can you discuss how the interpretation of the book has changed over time? We, we just talked about this a little bit, but obviously even th that was from when Melville wrote it to the early 19th or early 20th century, excuse me. How about now? Like, are we, are we interpreting it in different ways? Well, um, my sense is, is that it's somewhat fallen out of favor okay. because um, it's been, uh, at least in some cases, uh, displaced by different concerns. So I don't think, uh, while I think it's central to the American canon, I think that uh, universities are less and less concerned with canonical authors for whatever reasons that might be. So I don't think that uh, it's as uh, central to American intellectual or literary life as it was 50 years ago. On the other hand, the changes in the way people have looked at it, are, I mean, are, I think are pretty stark. It's viewed as being an adventure story by in the 19th century with a bunch of less than useful digressions, all right? And in the same way that it's possible to read Robinson Crusoe as, a, as an adventure story, it's possible to read this as a story about whales. And on one level, of course it is, but the imputation of a greater agenda and a larger set of intellectual concerns like we see in that really strange scene where you have the two beheaded whales, a right whale and a sperm whale, and one represents Kant and Plato, and the other represents Locke and, and something else. And then Ahab, of course, is talking to both of them. And you wonder uh, if this isn't so, doesn't have a sort of Dada quality to it. You yeah. can see why in the 1920s, they may like the crazy parts of this. Well, you spoke um, during your lecture, uh, you spoke of the references of homosexuality, uh, which I had actually, it was, it was interesting because I, had, I hadn't, I mean, like you read that and you see that, um, but one of the articles I had read um, included, you know, the same references you did, especially of Queequeg saying we are now married and, and some of those things. Um, I appreciated your more in-depth look at it because the article I read was just like, I, I wouldn't see that as homosexual. I would see that as fairly common for the time, but there are definitely other references throughout the book 
Um, but what of um, what of the religious context, um, especially Ishmael's sermon on the ship is what I call it. It's it's right in the beginning when he's trying to convince them that it doesn't matter if Queequeg has joined the ship, joined the church or not. The, we are all part of you know the sea, the search of the sea, um, and acceptance of Queequeg's pagan ways. It's a very early on in the book, and then how would this have been viewed at a time where Christianity obviously was kind of the rule of the land. Puritanism was still very much a part, especially in the area that Melville was writing this. I mean, Massachusetts was the land of the Puritan. Um, so yeah, what you had mentioned some censorship uh, regarding some of the religious context, but, but what of the other religiousness in the book? Okay. There's a lot. Uh, I mean, there's a heavy dose of the Bible and, uh, lots of theological musings written into Moby Dick. Uh, just the names themselves. Uh, Ahab, you know, who's the wicked king of Israel. Rachel, who is the mother who takes care of the children. Uh, there are many references to the Old Testament. And if you don't know those, then you really need to find them because you can't read this book without some knowledge of the biblical background. I mean, you really won't be able to put the, the the uh, po points together. So uh, you have uh, the outcasts, all right? And Ishmael speaks for all of them, call me, call me Ishmael. There's a sense in which everybody, each of the men on that ship is Ishmael. Each of them is an outcast from their own culture. So here we have a ship of outcasts who make up a kind of microcosm and their interactions indicates something about the parameters of human nature. And that is what makes it a much bigger book than it was originally thought to be because it was seen as an adventure story. Now I'd have to admit, along with Don Quixote, this is one of those books that might be twice as good if it were half as long. I mean, desperately yeah. needs an editor. But on the other hand, it is genuinely great at the length we have it. Yeah, I, I had, we got into a different question, but that was definitely one of mine. It was, it was a great analogy in your lecture of, of the editing of this would definitely probably have helped, but, but obviously Melville had a point and people are still reading it to this day. I only have about two more questions here. One came in from registration that I found was interesting, especially with, with how you've compared to the whale. So this was prior to hearing your um, lecture on it. But the question was, in the novel, is the whale representing life and how we human beings should deal with it? Um, I can't see it as representing light, life since it seems to spend much of its time hunting down whalers and killing them. In other words, yes, it, when it's attacked, it kills, but it also has gotten a taste for it. It knows it's good at it. So uh, this is a murderous sort of a, of a beast. Representing life, I wouldn't think so. Uh, there's no need to go to the Sea of Japan on behalf of, uh, by Ahab um, to chase this thing. He could catch whales in other parts of the world, but he's got to catch this one. So no, I don't think this is, uh, uh, that the whale itself represents life. Um, I think it represents uh, possibly evil, but more likely, um, our own mirage of what's evil, the illusions about evil that we can keep us, that we can, can sustain in our mind. There's also an element of that here in Ahab's craziness about this whale. And going back to the discussion we had about the ending of the book, you know, everybody besides Ishmael in the epilogue, you find out perishes. And I think when you and I were discussing it ahead of the webinar, I had mentioned, I was like, except for the whale, like, the whale is ambiguous because it has so many harpoons in it that you would assume that it probably, it, it doesn't say that it died at that moment, but you would assume that there's a possibility that it's not long for this world. And you brought up the, the thought process of that. If it is essentially representing evil or evil incarnate, it's an interesting statement of it doesn't matter what happens. Evil is always present in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I mean, if the whale dies, then Whale Jr. is going to take his place, all right? And then we can have a book, you know, Return of Son of Pequod, and, you know, they can destroy each other again. But um, it's a certain, there's a certain sort of Manichaean quality to the whale, like that's the bad half of the universe. And I'm not sure that we're going to be able to kill that off. So he leaves it open-ended, whether we can kill it or not. But I think that if we're capable of killing it, 
something uh, grows. It's like a hydra that replaces itself immediately upon destruction of the earlier head. Okay, before my final question, I have one more that just slipped in. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask that. Um, I was struck with the Trinity metaphors Melville invokes throughout three days and three nights, Ahab in some sort of fit off Cape Horn as Jesus was in the tomb three days and three nights, fulfilling the prophecy of Jonah who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. Um, I think Ahab sees himself as the second coming. Moby Dick is chased for three days. The Pequod is a three-masted ship. All were broken off the coast of Sh Japan. Yeah. What are uh, your thoughts on the Trinity references? All of that's there. There is lots of biblical numerology, not just threes, but certain, uh, biblical symbolism um, is all through the, the book. There's no doubt about that. That's another aspect. Uh, that's another advantage that you get from bringing some knowledge of the Bible to the mm -hmm. reading of uh, works of literature, at least in the Western tradition, because yeah, a lot of that gets dropped in here. You remember when Queequeg goes down into the hold of the ship and uh, gets sick because of the temperature down there and mm -hmm. his life is despaired of, they're going to put him in a coffin and then he resurrects himself. Um, there's a certain sort of Lazarus motif there. Uh, there's uh, a considerable amount of biblical references and Christian iconography that goes throughout it. And uh, I, I'd be inclined to say that it's like certain Shakespeare plays uh, where you can't properly understand what's going on unless you understand that there's a, a kind of religious mess element to the message of this. Interesting. I really like that, uh, that question. Thank you for submitting it. So finally, as we wrap things up, um, in one of the articles I read, and, and I know Mackenzie has shared most of these, including um, two articles of like, why should I read Mo Moby Dick? <laughs> um, but in one of the articles I read preparing for this, the column, columnist mentions that it is a shame that his book is so pushed, in, that this book is so pushed in high schools or colleges as a must read. Now it's not so much as it was, but it still is one of the, the you know, on a lot of syllabuses. Um, that you will actually get more from reading Moby Dick a bit later in life when you've had life experience and understand what's going on better. What are your thoughts on this? You are absolutely Is there a book for the right. young or a book for the old? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> there are very few books for the young. <laughs> I'll Fair. Start that. Um, there are some, but um, for the most part, uh, the wisdom that is contained in literature, various forms, um, is lost on 19 year olds right um it if you haven't actually suffered and i hear i mean real pain rather than losing your your iphone right yep. um it's hard to understand how tragedy works all right so in a way you might as well put tragedy off until you're at least 40 when life has smacked you around a little bit and you know the consequences of ill-judged decisions uh you know, I can teach Oedipus to freshmen, but they're not going to ask me about the intrinsic limitations of human uh, achievement, but mm -hmm. rather, is this going to be on the exam? Yep. And so uh, it's much better for certain kinds of literature. I think uh, the long Russian novels too, Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, Thomas Mann, I think they're largely wasted on the young as well. And that that's another, something that you know, is better taken on in middle age. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate thank it. It's been, it's been great. I love talking about these books with you. And uh, as I said, the last four of the series, including Moby Dick, are all those, you know, big undertakings of novels where we're off of the philosophy that we were on and especially the political philosophy and we're going into the fiction and, and the, the canon that is uh, that with Joyce and Mann and uh, Melville. So I appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, if you are enjoying the Classics Revisited series with Professor Michael Sagru, our next webinar will be on October 12th with Dostoevsky's intense novel, The Brothers Karamazov. I've already started reading it. it intensity is, is one of those words that I have to, to put to it. 
Um, you can register for it on our website today. It is already up there. Um, Kenzie has also shared a link in the chat. We have also set up a lecture per month for the remainder of the year, including the last two titles, um, which is Ulysses and The Magic Mountain. So be sure to keep an eye on our website for those. If you enjoyed today's webinar, Biblioteca is continually adding to our virtual event lineup. Uh, we invite you to view all our on-demand as well as upcoming events online at biblioteca.com and then navigate to our Insights and Trends blog page. And make sure you are subscribed to receive webinar updates by navigating to the bottom of any page on our website and hitting subscribe. Finally, as we wrap up today, we would love for everyone to complete a quick survey. It's always nice to hear from you. I always love seeing those comments as well, but it's good to know uh, what you're enjoying or what you might recommend as a future webinar series that we can do for you. Um, if you have any questions, comments, ideas, do let us know. We love to hear from you and use your feedback to continually evolve the webinar series we offer to libraries around the world. Just a reminder, we will circulate the chat log um, as well as links in our follow-up emails. So keep an eye out for those in your inbox as well as on our website. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and I hope you have a brilliant day.